Okay, Erev Tov, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well and ready to learn. And I want to thank Louise Katz, who is sponsoring this evening Sheer in memory of her mother today. Bo Bayom, Zion Kislev is the Orchid for her mother. Sarah Bat Menachem Mendel, uh, we wish that the Shema should have an Aliyah and we should have uh, good occasions to celebrate and wish a uh, long life and good health. Um, thank you. And uh, we should all be well. And many, many smachot. Okay, Dr. Sokolov, Vakasha. Okay, so uh, you may recall that uh, I left you last week with a question. So I'll return now to the question. Uh, I'll try to amplify it a bit, uh, and then we can move on. So uh, we concluded our uh, examination of the uh, <clears throat> constituent, 24 constituent books of Tanakh, Torah, Devi'im, and Ketuvim, and uh, with the Talmud as our uh, uh, springboard, we uh, examined the uh, questions large, the questions of authorship or uh, redaction of those books. Uh, and before we leave the subject of authorship and redaction and move to the subject of canonization, I, I wanted to say something about uh, redaction about the editorial process through which the uh, constituent books of Tanakh passed. And I want to do it by way of a comparison between three uh, biblical texts that overlap with each other, but um, more significant than the overlap are the several uh, places in which they differ from one another. And what I'd like to do is to present, first of all, to, uh, to identify those differences, and then to attempt to account for those differences as um, <clears throat> differences in opinion, uh, as actually reflections of editorial discretion. The historical incident that is described in each of these th sources is an event that transpired late in the eighth century BCE during the reign of King Chizkiyahu, Hezekiah, and that features an invasion of the territory of Judah and eventually a siege of the city of Jerusalem by the Assyrian conqueror Sanherib, Sennacherib. I say Sennacherib because that's at least what Lord Byron called him in a famous poem of his uh, recapitulating this event. So what we have here are parallel passages in the book of Malachim, in the book of Yeshayahu, and in Divrei Hayamim. So let's take a look very quickly. I've only excerpted two or three verses from each of the sources. And let's basically see, as I said, first of all, where they all agree and yet where they differ. So essentially, all sources agree that during the reign of King Chizkiyahu, more specifically in the 14th year of his reign, the province of the kingdom of Judah and specifically the city of Jerusalem, were invaded and besieged by Sanheriv, the king of Assyria. In that, they're all in agreement. What they disagree on was whether his invasion was successful. So take a look at the highlighted words. In both the book of Malachim and Yeshayahu, it says that uh, he encamped or he besieged all of the fortified cities of Judah, vayit pesem, and he seized them, he took them. In other words, his invasion and his siege was successful. Compare that to the conclusion of the verse in Divrei Hayamim. It mentions the same Arim Bitzurot, the same fortified cities, but instead of declaring emphatically and unambiguously 
that he was successful in capturing them. All it says is, Vayomer levikam elav, that it was his intention to break down their walls, to make a breach in their walls. Now, that doesn't rule out the possibility that he was successful, that he- I mean, it's for you the other half. Are you gonna have some? Objective, but it also opens the possibility that that was only his intention, but that it was not achieved. So right away, we have a difference between two of the biblical texts on the one hand and the third biblical text on the other. As I said, they could be reconciled, but on the other hand, it could be that they contradict each other. Now, in the continuation, sorry, in the continuation, sorry, it may be a little harder to read. First of all, note that we're down to two sources. That is to say that the event, as it is described here in Malachim on the left and Divrei Hayamim on the right, has no counterpart in the book of Yeshayahu itself. Okay, so if in the previous case, we might have been able to apply a rule of rabbinic hermeneutics, which is that if you have two sources that say one thing and a third source that says something else, you follow the majority. Here, there is no katuv hashlishi. What we have here are shnei ktuvim hamakhishim ze et ze. We have two biblical sources that contradict each other. But there is no katuv shlishi, there is no third source to tip the balance in one way or the other. But the difference between these two sources is considerable. If you look at the left-hand side, at the text from the book of Malachim, it says that after Sanchei was successful in capturing all of, the, all of the other fortified cities of Judah, he sent his uh, his eyes on the city of Jerusalem. So Chizkiyahu, the king of Judah, sent a message to Sanchei And the message is, and I've highlighted this, I have offended, return from me. Meaning Chizkiyahu is submitting to Sanchei He's apologizing for his behavior, and he is asking the Assyrian conqueror to remove the siege of Jerusalem. Not only that, but just again, to stick to the highlighted text. And Chizkiyahu gave him, gave Sancheriv, all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord, in the temple, and in the treasuries of the king's house, meaning, he agreed to pay tribute to the Assyrians if in exchange for the tribute, the Assyrians would lift the siege of Jerusalem. So if we had to characterize King Chizkiyahu's response to the Assyrian invasion based entirely and exclusively on the text of Sefer Malachim, we would have to say that Chizkiyahu was a coward who capitulated to the Assyrians. Now let's look at the other side and see how this is conveyed in the book of Divrei Hayamin. And when Chizkiyahu saw that Sanchei had come and that he was purposed to fight against Jerusalem, now the highlighted passage, he took counsel with his princes and his mighty men, his giborim, to stop the waters of the fountains which were without the city. Meaning, rather than submitting to the Assyrians, according to Divrei Hayamim, Chizkiyahu busies himself with making military preparations to fight the Assyrians. So that the first thing he does is he protects the city's water supply. Anybody who's been outside the walls of the old city of Jerusalem and visited the tunnel that's called the Shiloach, right? May remember, because I'm sure it was explained to you on the site, 
that this is the this is the fountain that King Hezekiahu sealed up in order to prevent the Assyrians from having access to it and in order to make sure that the inhabitants of the city could draw water from it without exposing themselves to the Assyrian enemy. And that's not all that he did. The next highlighted passage, he took courage and built up all the wall that was broken down. That if portions of the walls or the ramparts of Jerusalem needed repairing, then he had them repaired. And finally, he made weapons and shields in abundance. Okay. And not only that, he makes a speech to the people. Be strong and of good courage. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. God is with us. So if we had to characterize Hezekiah's reaction to the Assyrian invasion based entirely and exclusively on the text of Divrei Hayamim, we would say that Hezekiah was a brave leader of the Jewish people who was ready to defend the city of Jerusalem against all attackers. Which one was it? And in addition, why the silence of the book of Yeshayahu? To make a somewhat long story a bit shorter, here's the answer. The answer is that the point of view reflected in each of these three texts reflects the attitudes and the biases of their respective authors or editors. Now, just to remind you, according to the Talmud, the Book of Kings, Malachim, was edited by the prophet Yirmiyahu. The Book of Divrei Hayamim was edited by first Ezra and Nehemiah, and ultimately the Amshei Knesset HaGdolah, the men of the Grand Assembly. The book of Yeshayahu was edited by King Chizkiyahu himself and Siato and his entourage. Therefore, I would suggest the following. Of those three authors or editors, the one who's most likely to be biased in favor of Chizkiyahu are the authors or editors of the book of Yeshayahu, that is, Chizkiyahu and his royal entourage. Therefore, they simply limit themselves to a stipulation of the historical facts. The kingdom of Judah was invaded by the Assyrians and that the Assyrian invasion was by and large successful. Let's move on. How did King Chizkiyahu respond to this challenge? that they're not going to take a position on. We'll see why. On the other hand, let's look first in chronological order at the Book of Kings. What is the perspective of the prophet Yirmiyahu? Now, if you're acquainted with the Book of Yirmiyahu, then you know that Yirmiyahu was a highly unpopular character in his time, so much so that at one point he was even thrown into jail on account of the prophecies that he was carrying. Why? Because Yirmiyahu was a witness to the destruction of the temple. He lived during the final years of the reign of King Tzidkiyahu and the the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the exile of the Judeans. So when the city first came under siege, when the Babylonians first threatened the independence of the kingdom of Yehuda, Yirmiyahu was instructed by God to tell the people that they should submit to the Babylonians because it was more important for them, for the temple to remain intact and for them to be able to continue their service of God uninterrupted 
even at the cost of some of their political independence, then it would be for them to resist the Babylonians and risk the destruction of the temple. That was Yirmiyahu's message to the people, and it was an unpopular message in its time. Hence, as I said, he was thrown into jail. Now we can understand why when it came to, I'm sorry, when it came to describing Chizkiyahu's reaction, response to the challenge of the Assyrian, the earlier Assyrian invasion, what does Yirmiyahu report in the book of Malachim? How Chizkiyahu submitted to the Assyrians. As though to say, look, Jerusalem was threatened once before. Okay, The king paid a tribute. And as a result, Jerusalem was spared. The temple was spared. And the service of God continued uninterrupted. Now, who again are the authors or editors of the book of Divrei Hayamim? Ezra and Nehemiah largely. What do we know about the relationship of Ezra and Nehemiah to the city of Jerusalem? Well, the answer is that Ezra moved from Babylonia back to the land of Israel in order to supervise the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem. And Nehemiah was the one who had people working on the construction of the walls of Jerusalem, while, as the book of Nehemiah puts it, while one hand held a spear and the other held a trowel. So that the attitude of Nehemiah and, and Ezra towards the city of Jerusalem is the diametric opposite of that of Jeremiah. There, relationship to Jerusalem is that Jerusalem has to be rebuilt, the walls have to be repaired, the city has to be defended at all costs. Hence, when it comes to reporting King Chizkiyahu's reaction and response to the Assyrian invasion, they speak of him in terms of his stalwart defense of Jerusalem. Now, all this sounds very good, except of course for the one question that still matters. And that is, so which was it? Was Chizkiyahu the, the, the coward depicted in the book of Malachim or the hero depicted in the book of Divrei Hayamim? He certainly couldn't have been both, could he? Well, actually he could. He could have been both if in fact, the city of Jerusalem was threatened on two separate occasions by the Assyrians. And it's conceivable that on one of those occasions, Chizkiyahu's response was cowardly. On the other occasion, it might have been heroic. And indeed, we have access today, not only to the biblical sources we have had access to for millennia, but thanks to archeology, span we have for the past century or so, had access to the original records of King Sancheriv himself. And from the Assyrian annals of Sancheriv, it does in fact appear that he attempted to invade the kingdom of Judah on two different occasions. So while we have a contradiction between the biblical sources, we don't really have a disparity between them. They are both true. It's not as though only one of those sources is true and the other is what has often been called fake news, but both of these sources may very well have been historical and accurate. It's just that they reflect two different phases in an episode that lasted over a span of several years. <laughs>
Now, why the book of Yeshayahu is completely silent on the subject, and it shares neither the heroic viewpoint of Divrei Hayamim, nor the cowardly viewpoint perspective of Sefer Malachim, might be explained by the Mishnah that you see on the screen in front of you. Mishnah and Psachim reflect historically on the era of King Chizkiyahu, and it says, Shisha Dvarim Asach Chizkiyahu Melech, that King Chizkiyahu committed six acts, not only, but six in particular. Of these six, al shlosha hodulo, three of them, the, uh, the uh, sages representing uh, uh, posterity, looked upon them favorably. Va al shlosha lo hodulo, but on three other acts of Chizkiyahu, they did look, not look upon them favorably. What were his favorable acts? The first is that he didn't show deference to his late father, who is depicted in the book of Melachim as having been a wicked man, who didn't deserve any deference. And therefore the fact that Chizkiyahu had his father's bones dragged on a rope bier, the, the sages w w accepted that. He, um, he cut down the Nachash HaNechoshet, the copper serpent that Moshe Rabbeinu had fashioned at a time that the people had been um, uh, attacked by venomous serpents. And apparently that had become a cult object. And therefore Chizkiyahu's destruction of this cult object surely found favor in the eyes of the sages. And similarly, Ganaz, he concealed Sefer Refuot. Apparently, again, some sort of text that, uh, that um, was filled with some superstitious, uh, some superstitions. And therefore, its removal was also regarded favorably by the sages. What, however, were the three deeds of Chizkiyahu that were, um, that were viewed unfavorably? The fact that he raided the temple treasury in order to pay tribute to the Assyrians. The fact that what appeared to us as heroic, right, that he sealed off the water sources so that A, the people in the city of Jerusalem would have uninterrupted access to it and that access would be denied to the Assyrian invaders. We saw that as heroic. The sages, in retrospect, perhaps saw it as a failure to place implicit faith in God. And therefore, they viewed it unfavorably. And finally, the reason that this whole Mishnah is here in the Tractate of Pesachim, Iber Nisan Benisan, that he added an extra month to that year's calendar, but he did it after the month of Nisan had already begun, and that just simply is contrary to halachic practice. So again, I just wanted to conclude our uh, study of the subject of authorship by showing how the um, inclinations, maybe even call them biases, the editorial biases of individual authors or editors left their marks on certain biblical texts. Okay. And now we can move to our uh, new subject. And here I can even enlarge it. To the subject of canonization. Notice that canon is spelled with only one N, right? This is not canonization, uh, which is a, a, a fusillade, a, a uh, um, you know, uh, uh, shooting off uh, uh, big guns. Um, this is canon with a single M. Uh, the word canon is like, means an anthology, 
And while uh, the term uh, is used uh, largely to talk about um, the organization or the collection of religious books, it can really be used in uh, reference to any anthology. So certainly over the last generation, there has been a lot of discussion, heated discussion about which works of Western literature should be studied by college students. Should they all be works of what are called dead white males? What, what proportion should be um, works authored by women? What should, proportion should be works authored by minorities? And in all of those discussions, you would hear references to the literary canon. So that the term canon or anthology can be applied to any works of literature, but we're using it in its more traditional sense, its more classical sense, and that is a specific anthology of works that are considered to be religious. And the question that we are asking is, so we now know that there were 24 Jewish books written by a variety of different authors and collected by a variety of different editors, who and at what point in history was the decision made that these 24 books should be regarded as holy books, Kitvei Kodesh, and who, as it were, not only identified these 24 books as holy, but decided that these were the only such books that should be declared holy, and that subsequently no other books could be added to it. Again, just our weekly reminder that we're talking about a canon, an anthology that has three major parts to it. One part that's called the Torah, a second part that's called Nevi'im, and the third part that's called Ketuvim. So not only are we looking for sources that talk about the 24 individual books, we're also keeping an ear out, so to speak, for something, any sources that would seem to, to uh, uh, give us a clue to the distribution of these books amongst any or all of these three categories. So of course, a point of departure once again, the Talmud, even though as we'll see in a moment, the Talmud is far from being our earliest source of information on this subject. It still is our most reliable source. And these are two Talmudic passages with which we began three weeks ago, okay? Before the Talmud asks the rhetorical question, umi ketavan, who were the authors of the 24 books of the Bible? It starts by simply stipulating sidran, their order or their sequence. Once you're using the term order or sequence, that already reflects the existence of a canon. Because only after you have already decided that these particular texts will constitute the Bible, does the question then arise of, well, okay, so I have 24 individual biblical books. In what order do I arrange them? The whole question of order presupposes the, uh, the identification of these books as belonging together. Otherwise, the question of their order or their sequence is, is immaterial. We could even suppose, and this is only a supposition, that the question wasn't, uh, wasn't one of what is their order of importance, but really what is their physical order? Meaning that if I were to place all of these 24 books, one on top of the other, in what order would I be placing them? Now, it's maybe a misleading 
the misleading figure of speech because they're not books yet, right? We're, we're a few weeks away from describing the process by which these 24 original works of Jewish literature became part of a book. But long before they were part of a book, they existed, they had separate and independent existences as scrolls. And you can put a scroll, one scroll on top of another, just as you can pile books one atop another. So again, the fact that the Talmud raises the question of in what order should the books of Nevi'im be placed? And in what order should the books of Ketuvim be placed? Reveals to us that at the time that these Talmudic passages were recorded, which is anywhere between the third and the fifth centuries of the common era, right? the books that they're talking about were already recognized as being canonical, that is to say as being parts of an anthology of special holy books. Now, again, notice some of the books are already called Nevi'im. Other books are already called Ketuvim. And that the order in the Talmud of the books of the Nevi'im and the books of Ketuvim, and we've already gone through this, is a chronological order, the sequence being the order of those people who are regarded traditionally as their authors and their editors. Now, with that framework in mind, we're going to look first at what historical sources we have for the process of canonization. And following the historical sources, we will look at the rabbinic sources. So the earliest source that we have that seems to reflect the existence of an anthology of religious books comes from a book written in Alexandria of Egypt in the second century BCE, right? That puts it several hundred years before the Talmud by someone whose full name was Shimon ben Yehuda ben Sira. And in chapter 44 of his book, he speaks in praise of Israel's great ancestors. And you see the highlighted passages amongst Israel's great ancestors were sages, skilled in composition, authors, authors of proverbs, composers of psalms, and writers of poems. Now, he doesn't name the compositions, okay? He doesn't tell us what kinds of poems, but it's entirely reasonable to assume that by Proverbs, he's referring to the biblical book called Mishle, Proverbs, or perhaps the biblical book called Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, which is also a collection of Proverbs or aphorisms by Psalms. It's almost unquestionable that he's talking about the book of Tehillim. And by poems, he could be referring to the biblical book of Shir Hashirim, which even has the word poems in its uh, title, or it could be a reference to any other biblical book that has poetic sections in it. 
So this arguably is the earliest source that we have. It tells us at the very least, or I'll even admit, maybe even at most, what it tells us is that the idea that biblical books, right, works of, of religious literature could be divided into different categories. One category called either Proverbs or wisdom literature, Chochmah. Another category being called Tihilim or Tishbachot. A third category being called Shirim, okay? That the idea that biblical that works of religious literature were already thought of as belonging to different categories may not be conclusive evidence of canonization, but it certainly points the finger in the right direction. The next source, also from the second century BCE, is one of the several books of the Maccabees, the Maccabim. Okay. These are books that are not part of the biblical canon, although they're part of the canon of the, of the Christian, of some Christian denominations. And these are the books that record the uh, largely the military activities, successes and failures of the Maccabim of the Maccabees, right? Today's the seventh of Kislev. We're only a few weeks away from Hanukkah. So here is at least a sentence or two out of one of the original books of the Maccabim. And in it, the author is reflecting on historical event. That is when King Solomon built the original temple he celebrated its inauguration for eight days, just as the Maccabees, when they, uh, when they um, uh, were able to restore the temple and to cleanse it, also marked their uh, inauguration of the temple with an eight day celebration. The same things were also reported in the writings and commentaries of Nehemiah. That is to say, when the, when the walls of Jerusalem and the, were finished and the second temple was constructed, they also celebrated it for eight days. Curiously, the eight days that they celebrated during the time of Nehemiah were the eight days of the holiday of Sukkot. Okay? And how he, Nehemiah, founding a library, gathered together the acts of the kings, the acts of the prophets, and the acts of David, and the epistles of the kings concerning the holy gifts. Without getting into too much detail, because it's rather a difficult passage to, uh, to break down, what we have once again is a clear reference to the collection together of separate works of literature that were viewed as having a common feature, and that is that they were all regarded as religious works, okay? And again, we can also see evidence of their division into categories. The Acts of the Kings could be what we call Nevi'im Rishonim, right? The books of Samuel and Shmuel and Malachim. The books of the prophets could be what we call Nevi'im Acharonim, Yeshayahu, Yirmiyahu, Yechezkel. The book of David could be the book of Psalms. That would be our second reference specifically to the book of Psalms, to the works of David but it doesn't rule out the possibility that by the books of David, they're referring not just to the individual book of Tehillim, but to some of the other books of Ketuvim as well. The third and most detailed and informative historical source we have comes from the first century of the common era from a book 
called against Appian. Appian was a pagan priest who, um, uh, who uh, um, wrote um, uh, calumnies uh, against the Jewish religion. And Josephus, who was um, a, 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 a sage as well as a, uh, a general uh, in the war against Rome, uh, wrote a defense of Judaism uh, against Appian. Therefore, he talks a lot about the religion. And here, as you see in a particular section of that book, he says, we have not an innumerable multitude of books among us, disagreeing from and contradicting one another as the Greeks have. But he says, we, the Jews, have only 22 books, which contain the records of all past times Okay, which are justly believed to be divine. So according to Josephus, there is already a canon. There is already an acknowledged collection, anthology of special religious books. And he even tells us the breakdown. Five belong to Moses. That would be the Torah. Okay. Then he says that... Um, uh, sorry, just my screen's a little, okay. Um, so, um, five belong to Moses, okay? Uh, and everything from Moses till the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, that is to the beginning of the second temple period, is in one of 13 books of the prophets. So we have five books of Moses, 13 books of Nevi'im, and then the remaining four books, he calls books of hymns to God, that could be Tehillim, right? And precepts for the conduct of human life. That could be Mishlei, right? Could be Kohelet. Now, so while on the one hand, as I said, this is the uh, richest source that we have of information about the emergence of a canon of, uh, of works that were considered to be uh, divinely inspired. The big problem is that Josephus says there are 22 of them, while without my having to go back to that original slide, I do hope that by now you all recall that the, uh, that the Tanakh consists of 24 books. So the challenge that scholars have tried to meet is to reconcile the, 20, the list of Josephus of 22 books with the fact that the Tanakh as we know it today has 24 books. Now, there are two ways in which to reconcile this. I would suggest that the simplest way to reconcile it is to say, well, you know, we've seen that the, that the canon developed over time. So maybe by the middle of the first century of the common era, 22 books had been admitted to the canon Right? And those are the 22 that Josephus wrote about, while two other books right, were only admitted to the canon after Josephus. Right? If indeed, remember that if indeed canonization is not a one-time affair, but an ongoing process, then as I said, the easiest explanation would be there were 22 books in the first century, but by the time of the Talmud, 100 years later, they had already admitted two more books. And indeed, a little later on, not this evening, but in the week to come, we will actually see Mishnaic and Talmudic evidence to support that idea, that supposition, that there may well have been 22 books that were accepted at this point in time, 
while two other books, and we may even be able to identify them, were admitted to the canon only subsequently. Okay. It's interesting that Josephus, having made reference to the canon, also says in the continuation of this passage, for during so many ages as have already passed, no one has been so bold as either to add anything to them, to take anything from them, or to make any change in them. Which he may very well have been entitled to say in his own lifetime, and particularly given the context in which he is defending Jerusalem, I'm sorry, defending Judaism against the calumnies of a pagan priest. He does not want Judaism to appear to be fluctuating, but he wants it to appear to be something that is constant and consistent. As I said, of course, our Tanakh has a total of 24 books rather than 22, and the internal divisions are somewhat different as well, right? We have five books of Moses, just like Josephus had five books of Moses. But whereas Josephus said there were 13 books of prophets, our Nevi'im consists of only eight books. And whereas he counted only four books of what he called Psalms, right? We have 11 books of Ketuvim. And therefore, once again, these discrepancies have been addressed by scholars who have suggested, as you can see on the screen in front of you, some ways in which to reconcile the uh, the uh, canon of Josephus with our own. For example, three of the four books that Josephus calls hymns and precepts are certainly, as I mentioned, Tehillim Mishlei and Dio. The fourth, however, based on his characterization of precepts for the conduct of human life, is probably Sefer Kohelet, Ecclesiastes. Now, the books of Daniel, Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles that are part of our Kituvim may very well be classified as prophetic historical, right? As being part of Nevi'im rather than Kituvim, based on Josephus's characterization of them as books that reported on what was done in their times. So this is a novel approach. The same books. Right? There's no question but that the 22 books that he's talking about are 22 of the books that are in our Tanakh today. But the fact that we consider some of those books to be Ketuvim does not entirely rule out the possibility that during the time of Josephus and at other times as well, those same books may have been regarded as part of Tanakh, but considered part of the rather than part of Ketuvim. And finally, the alternative, and that is that in two cases, books of Tanakh that we consider to be separate might at some point in time have been joined together. Specifically, the book of Rut may have been appended to the book of Shoftim. And you may recall during our discussion of Shmuel's author, since the book of Rut starts by saying, by he be made why could it not have simply been four chapters in that book? Okay. And the, as you see here, that in fact, in some editions of the Greek Septuagint of the very early first century translation of the Bible into Greek, indeed, the book of Rut, instead of being a separate book, is an appendix to the book of Shoftim. And similarly, the book of Echa, which was written by Yirmiyahu, according to the Talmud, was similarly considered as an appendix to the book of Yirmiyahu. So that if in fact, 
Josephus's canon contained the enlarged books of Shoftim and Yirmiyahu, then even though he counted them as only 22, they might in fact be one and the same with our 24. And with that, I will consult the chat. Okay. Which is later Kings or Chronicles? The two, two things. The question you mean later, which was written later or which reflects a later era in biblical history? Okay. So um, the book of Kings, uh, ends essentially with the destruction of the first temple, but it concludes on a note of consolation with the recognition that uh, King Cyrus of Persia allowed the Jews to leave the Babylonian exile and return to Jerusalem. The book of Chronicles even reports on things that happened in Jerusalem after the Jews returned from the Babylonian exile. So Chronicles is later than Kings. Okay. Whether Hezekiah was a coward or a hero or a realist, it's a matter of interpretation. Okay. The second time he has no tribute left, so he has to fight. You know, that's an interesting question historically. It's a question of, of, of historiography, of the writing of history. And that is that if, in fact, there were two separate Assyrian invasions of Judah, and Hezekiah's reaction to one of them was tribute, and to the other it was, uh, it was uh, um, the defense of, of the city, resistance, okay? Then the question really is, you know, which one do you think came first? To the best of my recollection, and, and I, I'm not certain about this, the Assyrian sources are not clear on the subject. I don't think that from the Assyrian sources we can actually tell whether the successful invasion preceded it or not. Logic would seem to dictate the other way around, right? Logic would seem to dictate that if the first invasion was successful, why would he have to invade a second time? So logic would seem to indicate that the first attempt was unsuccessful, and then Sennacherib attempted it a second time, and the second time was successful. Then you have to match that up to the two different depictions of Chizkiyahu. Do you see him as having been heroic, in, in heroic and therefore having forestalled the original invasion? Right? And then when the Assyrians came a second time, he couldn't do it anymore, so he gave in. That's a way to look at it. Or, as I said, do you look at it the other way around? Okay. Um, serpent in the Book of Remedies, Greek God, Greek God of Medicine. It's a different. The 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 the, the symbol of medicine is not a snake. Okay, it's a caduceus which sounds like a Jewish word, but it isn't. It's C-A-D-U-C-E-O-U-S, something like that. Caduceus, you got to look it up. Okay. Is the Karaite order of the Bible the same? The best of my knowledge, yes. So much so that uh, Rabbi Kelman uh, mentioned at the outset that there's been some discussion on a different, uh, on a different uh, channel uh, of, uh, of the uh, work of the Masoretes. Uh, and he mentioned Ben Asher and Ben Naftali. And there have actually been scholarly opinions that identified uh, that identified them as Karaites. Uh, so we, we'll get to that uh, in in turn also. But um, and do the Karaites accept any canonical books other than the Torah? Uh, yes, um, they, certainly. They they they, they um, even the Samaritans um, have what we call a hexateuch, right? Penta is five, hexa is six, right? Even the Samaritans, who from a strict halachic and Talmudic perspective aren't even Jewish, okay, except in addition to the five books of Moses, they also accept the book of Joshua. The Karaites consider the entire 24 books of the Bible to be canonical. Okay. Um, 
what didn't make the canon, like Maccabees. We'll get to it. We, as I said, we're, 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 we're only, we're only, we're only um, uh, gotten a little bit beyond the surface uh, of canonization this week. Um, Ezra Nehemiah, we've mentioned this before, Ezra Nehemiah count is only one book, right? At the same time that the Book of Kings was split in two, that the Book of Chronicles was split in two, right? Uh, for some reason, the Book of Ezra was split in two. But unlike Kings and Chronicles, which was simply called part one and part two, the Book of Ezra, when it was split into two, was attributed to two different authors because Nehemiah was essentially the equivalent of Ezra. Um, Again, as I said, the, 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 the um, moving four books out of Ketuvim into Nevi'im, uh, whatever it is, unless Ezra Nehemi were indeed counted as two at that time, no. Um, we'll get to the, the 23, uh, I assure you, um, in, in, uh, in next week's class. That's pretty much it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the thing about uh, the master rights being carried came up very briefly in Monday's class. There's, there's so many asked, but I think uh, Dr. Huart's not not, but uh, right, right, whatever. I think, like you say, there is, um, you know, you scholars debate that. Okay, yes, there's this. And um, the Karaites were very into Mikra. That's why they're called Karaites. They uh, knew the stuff uh, very well. Okay, thank you very much. Of course, I, I saw the, uh, uh, recently that the Yemenites talk about the Octotok the eight books, and I forget which eight they are, but they use the term, you know, Pentateuch, Hexateuch, they use the term to refer to the Yemenites uh, uh, canon as the Octateuch. I forget which where they stopped. I don't know. Live and learn, but I, 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 I will look it up. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, tomorrow, Tomorrow, Shuli Mishkin, of course, continue her series at 12 noon on the medieval Israel, the Jews in the land of Israel during the medieval period. Um, and tomorrow night, the Parsha Shir, 8.30 p.m., Rabbi Gedalia Berger, who teaches uh, both at the GPAS program and the Yoatzet Halacha program, has served as a rabbi living in Gintinek now. That's the Parsha tomorrow night at 8.30. And um, then I'll be giving this shear, my weekly shear on the sitter, 9.30 a.m. on Friday morning. Look forward to learning with you. Uh, please invite your friends. As we say, that's the price of admission. And uh, we hope to see you soon. And everybody will. Lie the top. And we'll see you next week, Dr. Sokolov. Thank you. Pleasure. Okay. Thank you very up. much. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.